Hi everyone, good afternoon. Sarah Noel Wilson here. We just wanted to go ahead and start. Uh, we aren't going to officially start for a few moments, so we're giving time for people to come in, but I just wanted to connect with you, say hello. Um, so, you know, feel free to shoot a, a message of greeting in the chat so we know that you're here. I hope everyone is having a perfectly beautiful human day, you know? And what I mean by that is that you're just, you know, allowing yourself to be present with whatever it is you're experiencing. Uh, shoot me a, like, send a message in the chat if you're listening to this. What's a word that would describe, like, where are you at now? Not physically where are you at, but energetically where are you at? Like, what's a word that would describe how you're feeling in this moment? So you can go ahead and, oh, oh, just to be, Clear. Don't put it in the question. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, so that way we can we can see things in the chat and we can all connect with each other. So if you're chatting, make sure you chat in the chat box, not in the question box. Thank you. I'm just reading through some of the messages. Now, I wonder, Rachel, if you can pop on a second. I think we got a message that some people can't see the chat box. And I was curious if that's something that we needed to enable and if we should uh, um, just want to check in with you before we, we move forward. Hi, yes, I am investigating ASAP. Um, and so we will get the chat box enabled within a few seconds. One moment. Thank you, darling. Since the beauty of you know technology and experimenting. Yes, so we are figuring out the chat box. I don't know why. I can see it. I'm using it. But, but we'll figure it out. So and just give us a minute and we can we can hang out a second. Oh, so Sarah Castilli Castley says that she can see it. Um, and it looks like we must have just been in, able to enable it. So if you are able to see it, go ahead and jump in there and drop your messages there. Oh, is it combined? So some people are saying it's combined. Okay. Well, so this is in full transparency and I believe in transparency and I believe in authenticity um, is that uh, uh, I, you know, we come from where we're at. And so it looks like it's combined on your end, which is just good for us to know, which is fine. So we'll just work with that. And so let me go ahead and I'm going to bring up my questions box just so I can see it. And it sounds like people can see my message only, and, and you should be able to set it so that you can respond to all. And again, Rachel, I'll give you a shout out just to make sure that we have it set up so people can respond to all. I don't know if we have a setting in there. Um, what is set that everyone should be able to respond? um and be able to see all well that's okay so we you know here's the thing we can still have a lovely a lovely conversation and we will do our best to share what people are saying um uh and 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 we'll figure this out so 
Um, with that, I want to be conscious of time because we do have content to go through. So Rachel um, Peterson, my colleague, is on the line taking care of from a technology perspective. And so what we will do is just when we ask you questions and, and to participate, just go ahead and put it in the question box or the chat box. Uh, you know, again, in full disclosure, this is the first time we're using GoToWebinar. We're used to Zoom. And so there's a little bit of experimenting, right? This is this is why this topic is so important right now, because we're all just experimenting and trying to figure this out together. So uh, with that, Rachel, I think we are ready to go ahead and get started. Let me just get my screen minimized and set up so I can get it all ready to go. Um, like all of you, I'm working from home, but I will tell you that I, um, you know, I put on makeup for you. I'm I'm wearing perfume, but you might hear some dogs barking over there in a minute. So the other thing that I will share is that I am going to have to turn off my video right now simply because when we were testing this, there was a pretty significant delay in between my screen and your screen when my video was on. So with this, I'm going to go dark, but not with my voice. So hang with us and let's get started. All right. So I just want to take a moment and review some logistics um, related to. Now, some of these logistics are going to be updated based off of the what we're learning from the technology um, piece of GoToWebinar and how, how it's set up today. But the first is that um, just from a logistical perspective, um, we just we want to make sure that we're having opportunities to interact with each other and to connect with each other. So um, uh, you know, just go ahead and share in the questions box. I know my slide says to show in the um, the chat box. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so go ahead and just in the questions box, go ahead and put things on. And Rachel, what I will do when I'm asking questions, since I am not able to see that screen as quickly, I'm going to have you just read some of the comments that you're seeing or things that you're hearing. So. Um, so I'll just give you the cue when we do that. The other thing is we recognize that the internet is um, at capacity right now. I'm sure all of you are experiencing this with your, your phone calls and your video calls at work, as well as with your friends and family, that we are at capacity. And so what I will say is that if you are having any issues with audio or video, um, I encourage you to just drop out, come back in, but please know we are recording this and the recording will use the native um, audio file uh, as well as the video file in the beginning and so the recording of this will will be good so so with that let's go ahead and jump into our content so just a little bit about me and my background for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet my name is Sarah Noel Wilson I'm a leadership coach and consultant and what you should know about me is that I'm I'm very passionate about helping people develop um, better relationships with themselves and better relationships with other people. And I'm really fortunate to be surrounded by some incredible um, people on my team um, that you'll see here in a moment. So I'm noticing, so just so you know, on my end, uh, there's about a 15 second delay between slides. When we talk about the brain under stress, we're going to use this whole experience for that. But so here's my team, or at least some of them. And so the work that we do is we're really committed to, you know, working with leaders to help them build, rebuild, and heal teams. And when we talk about leadership, I don't think leadership is tied to a role. I think it is something that all of us do some of the times. And um, and so we're really excited about that. But I do want to I do want to hear from you, and I'm curious. Um, where are you calling in from? So let's just take a moment and connect. And, and Rachel, what I'll ask you to do is to go ahead and unmute yourself. And as you are seeing people um, share, just go ahead and share. What, you know. So what I'd love to know is what is your name and where are you calling in from? So I'll give you a moment just to connect so we can see. Um, oh, my gosh. So we well, information. we are located across the US. We have Baltimore, Maryland, Memphis, Tennessee, Illinois. We have lots of Iowa people. Um, Seattle, Washington, um, Cedar Falls, oh yeah, tons of Iowa people, Maryland, um, Alabama, hello, Alabama, Wisconsin, hello, Florida. Hello, Carl, Florida, Colorado, Richmond, Virginia. I love seeing like we're all just connecting from across the U.S. 
I love this. And you know what's so amazing about that is like that we're all coming together for a topic that is so beautifully human. And sometimes in our previous experience working with leaders, like empathy sometimes is like treated like this weird, you know, kind of like four letter word. And we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, um, and uh, so I love the fact that we're coming from all of these places to connect in such deeply beautiful, meaningful ways. And so I know that you can't see where everyone's coming from um, and, but I just want to take a moment and just encourage us all to just take a moment and, you know, there's 308 attendees on the line right now from all over the country who are here because they want to show up more powerfully for the people in their lives. And there's something really, really amazing about that. So I want to talk a little bit about why this topic and why this was the place that we wanted to explore. You know, as I mentioned, we are, um, we are really focused on helping people build, rebuild, and heal teams. And what I will tell you is that for the past decade, I have been studying adaptive leadership. How do we help people not only survive significant change and disruption, um, but, but more importantly, how do we help them thrive? So how do we how do we help them thrive in this this time of change? And and we can all we all know, right? Like the elephant in the room is the fact that we are collectively as a like humanity are experiencing a disruption in a way that we've never experienced in most of our lifetime, right? Every single one of us is experiencing some kind of impact either to us physically, psychologically, potentially financially, right? Emotionally, all of these things. And so we all are collectively in this, this, this time of change. And that is why it's so important that we can show up and help people navigate this disruption again in a way that not only will we survive it, but we'll thrive from it. And the other thing that I will share and why we started with this topic was we have a firsthand view of a lot of teams and leaders and companies and I will tell you that this situation has brought out some amazing, amazing things, some amazing behaviors, some amazing connections. We have heard stories about leaders who are foregoing or decreasing their salary so that they can make sure that they can continue to pay your team. We have heard stories about people who are um, doing what they need to do to help their team navigate this difficult time in really meaningful ways. And then, you know, the reality is, is that under times of stress, sometimes we also don't always show up at our best. And so we've also heard stories on the other end of the spectrums. You know, I recently heard a story about a company that sent out a PowerPoint that basically was like, here's what not to do. Right. It was sort of a list of like, don't watch TV when you're working from home. Don't do this while you're working from home. And this idea of business as usual. And I think we can all collectively agree this is not business as usual. And so what we want to do in, is just explore how can we show up more powerfully? How can we show up more powerfully for the people who we serve, for the people we lead, for the people we work with, for the people we live with, right? In a way that we will come together. And it's interesting, you know, I don't know about you, but when I hear these stories around like, well, on one end, there's the leader who's willing to sacrifice their own wages. And then on the other end, there's the leader who's saying, business as usual, who would you wanna work for, especially right now? There's chaos. And you know we are, as humans, looking for calm in the chaos. And, um, and, and part of our jobs as leaders is to really help develop those, to build those deep trusting relationships, to be able to connect in those meaningful ways. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take a moment and just connect with this idea of trust right now, right? Because we know that the longer our brain lives in uncertainty, the more it creates doubt. And when we have doubt, it's more likely to lower our level of trust. We're, we're less likely to trust the people around us. So just give it a moment because the slide is coming. Um, there's, a, there's a pretty significant delay on my part. Now it's, um, there, there she is. All right, there she goes. Okay, so let's talk about trust. So, um, Trust, the factors that contribute to trust um, are, are complex and there's 
a number of different factors that impact how you might trust somebody, why you might trust somebody. There are factors that are different for how maybe the trust I need with my sister might look different than the trust I need with my team members, which might look different than the trust I need with my clients. But all relationships ultimately will fall and need these three components. And we like to think of this as the trust triangle. So the trust triangle is essentially built up of three key components. So the first one is, and I wanna start at the top is authenticity, right? That in a relationship, we have really good BS meters. We are really, I mean, we, we all have met people where you go, I know, I know you're saying this is who you are, but in my head, I'm feeling like you're maybe something else, right? So when we question how somebody shows up, who they are, when that leg of the, the stool starts to become wobbly, that's going to start to impact our trust. The other angle of it or the other uh, corner that I want to talk about is empathy, right? That in a relationship, we are more likely to develop that deeper level of trust when we feel like they care about who we are what our experience is. I like to think of this as, you know, once I know someone really has my back in a meaningful way, I'm more likely to trust them. And then the third component of the trust triangle is logic, right? Do you, are you um, thoughtful? Do I agree with your logic? Are you able to communicate your ideas clearly? And in any situation, right, it's important that all three of these are strong. And I'm sure as I'm talking about these, you can probably imagine somebody in your life um, that is having, uh, you know, that you can think about, you know, the level of trust you have with them um, uh, and imagine like what corner was maybe like a little, little weak. Um, I noticed that there's a question coming up and I want to address it. And it's why would business as usual be a bad thing? I've, and we'll talk in more detail about this. Um, because the reality is, is that right now our worlds are rocked in a bit. So I'm gonna, I want to honor that question and let you know that we'll come back to us um, to explain why, like how we, how we need to show up a little bit differently right now because the realities of our team members and the people in our lives are differently right now. So just wanted to acknowledge that. So, so this is sort of the basis of our trust triangle. And when one of them are weak, then you write that the relationship starts to struggle. And, and especially right now, in this time of change and disruption, um, empathy is becoming really, really important. And in one of the things that I, so I wanna take a moment and then and define what do we mean when we talk about empathy? And it's going to take a moment for the slide to come up, but I'll read to you the definition. And, I, and, I will, and somebody is asking about, will the slides be available for download? We will make the, uh, slides available for download. So we will, when we follow up, not only will you get a copy of the recording, but we'll also give you a PDF of all the slides so you can see them since I'll be moving through some of them fairly quickly and you might not see them all just because of the, the technical delay that's happening. But when we talk about empathy, the way that I love to define it is just really simple. The ability to understand and to share the feelings of another. Right. And I was raised by my parents very much raised me with the belief of you need to be willing to step into someone else's shoes before you criticize, before you judge them. So empathy is ultimately just the ability to understand and to share the feelings of another. Right. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the myths that come up with this. But when when I think of empathy and when I think of being an empathetic leader, I love this idea of part of being an empathetic leader is, is holding space for people, right? So there's this really beautiful phrase of just holding space for someone. That empathy isn't about, I don't need to fix you. I don't need to solve your problems. Um, I don't necessarily like need to, uh, you know, I just need to hold space for whatever it is you're experiencing. And this is a quote that my dear friend, Stephanie Chin always shares with me whenever we talk about and we're having um, challenges, like whenever, whenever one of us is having a challenge, emotional challenge, the other will say, like, how can I hold space for you right now? And she'll share this quote. And I love this quote so much that this idea of holding space is you walk along with them without judgment, sharing their journey to an unknown destination, yet you're completely willing to end up wherever they need to go. 
And what I love about this is there's two, two pieces that I've highlighted that I think are so important in this concept is one is that holding space and being an empathetic leader is to do so without judgment. You can't connect to somebody if you're judging them. You can't connect to somebody if you are criticizing them. Um, and the other piece of it that I highlighted is it's wherever they need to go, right? Sometimes we think we know what's best for people. Sometimes I fall into this trap. Um, but, but to recognize that, again, empathy is about acknowledging what they are experiencing, what they are going through, and what they need ultimately um, to move forward. So why does this matter for us as leaders? I mean, there's a couple of things. One, um, when people feel heard, when they feel taken care of, they're far less likely to worry. And we know right now in this situation, there's a lot of worry in the room. There's a lot. And there's worry in the room that we don't even realize is there. As people, we don't even realize our brains are processing it. And there is worry in the room, you know, that we as leaders aren't aware that our team members are thinking of. And so, um, and so if, if we can show up empathetically, people are gonna spend way less time worrying, way less time reaching out to you, and way less time either ruminating or talking to their peers, right? We, as we were talking about this concept, um, my colleague, Teresa on the team, you know, she made this really beautiful point is, you know, sometimes we think that the way you get productivity is by having like a hard line. But the reality is, is we know that a safe brain is how you get productivity. When we can calm down the, the brain's stress responses, people are more creative, they're more productive, they're more able to be connected and showing up. The other thing is, and this, what I'm talking about is a little bit different than what you're seeing on your screen, because that's coming up next. I'm trying to anticipate, anticipate the screen so we can get them up. But empathy is this incredible tool to maximize your problem solving. And what I mean by that is that if you truly understand what are the challenges your team members are experiencing or the people in your life, if you understand instead of assuming you know, you're able to actually solve for the situations that they're experiencing. Um, you know, as we were talking about this, I think a really beautiful you know, example of this is uh, Teresa and I, as we were chatting, she was talking about how when she was um, working as a, a leader in an education system, she was pregnant with her second child and had one, one little child at home. And, 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 you know, she would work during the day, go home, only had two or three hours with her son, and then she would hop online the, the next night, right? Or the, at the end of the night after he would go to bed. And so, because what was important to her and what, you know, part of her challenge was, was the fact that she only had a few hours with her son. So she wanted to maximize that. And then she was hopping online. And, um, and, and the way that the, the leader at the time responded was like, well, if you really want to get ahead, you know, you really need to be in the office until like six or seven, like some of the other leaders. And it was this missed opportunity of recognizing like, what does that person need? How can they show up in a way that will not only serve them personally, but also allow them to show up even more productively, more engaged professionally? I think sometimes we get into this trap of like, oh, work has to look a certain way, happen a certain way. And right now that's all getting disrupted, especially, you know, th those of you with kids know that this is a massive disruption for you as well. And, um, and so I just wanna pause and, and, and take, take a break. And I wanna look at some of the questions that are coming in and, um, and just to like notice it. And so some of the questions and thoughts are coming in, we're actually going to address those, so good. So we'll keep moving on. Um, so again, just a reminder, people, you know, for those of you who really value efficiency, um, what I can tell you is that if your people don't feel safe and don't feel taken care of, um, they won't be efficient because they're worried about other things and we're trying to minimize that so they can show up at their best, right? So this is how this works. Sometimes we have to go slow to go fast. Um, so let, let's talk about some of the myths that we hear um, pretty consistently when we've been working with leaders. I mean, and some of these are things we've heard over the last year and you know, we're, we've been having a lot of conversations about this. So I just wanna talk about sort of three common myths that comes up when we talk about empathy. So the first is um, a lot of times people will talk about empathy as like a weakness, um, particularly, I mean, and I, and I definitely would say sometimes this gets, this discussion comes along a gender divide. And part of that is because, right, our, our society, our, our social construct is that it's, it's, it's a sign of weakness for a man to have emotions where it's not necessarily for a woman. But we hear in teams where it's like, ah, Sarah, you know, 
no, no, empathy, it's just kind of squishy, you know, or it feels a little like, yeah, I, I love squishy, you know, it's a little squishy, Sarah. And I just think that it's a sign of, I just don't know. I mean, like I'm analytical, I'm whatever. And we were working with one leadership team and, and one leader was talking about just this idea of like, uh, empathy is, I don't know, I think logic is more important. And then when we talked about what does he appreciate um, in, in, in people he works with and teams he works with, the, the number one thing he said was that they understand where I'm coming from, that they would consider my perspective. And everything he was saying was describing empathy. Like that's what empathy is. So empathy is not a weakness and we'll dig into that more. The second myth that comes up is that people think that um, to be empathetic means you can't hold people accountable. And I think that this is a really important distinction, again, because empathy is about just understanding and meeting people where they're at. That's not saying you're removing accountability. There are still expectations. There are still some expectations even now in this disrupted world of things we have to try to move towards in the best way we can given the circumstances. But you can be empathetic and hold somebody accountable. I mean, this is, you know, beautiful work that's been addressed in, you know, things like radical candor and Brene Brown's work. And so I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, what that looks like. Let's say you're giving feedback to somebody and you can tell it's really hard for them to hear. Um, now, you, you, your default might be like, oh, I want to sugarcoat it. I want to make them feel better. And it's like, no, you can be empathetic and say something to the effect of, um, I, uh, I know that this is, I can see how hard this is for you to hear because I know that this isn't the impact you want to make. Um, and I'm telling you this feedback because I think I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't share this with you. Um, I had a situation a number of years ago when I was first in leadership and I had an employee who had been struggling for some time from on a performance, um, performance issues, right? Great, great person, just wasn't the right fit. And, and the way that we approached the conversation or the way that I approached the conversation was I simply just, you know, was really di direct and heartfelt with them. And I said, listen, as your friend, I want to see you succeed. Like I desperately want to see you succeed. And as your manager, I need to see you. Like I need to see you succeed. So you see how we can be empathetic and hold people accountable. Um, so those aren't those aren't contradictions, right? They actually work really beautiful together. And you know, a webinar for another day <laughs> on giving feedback is right. Like people are more likely to hear it when they know it's coming from a place of their best interest. This the final myth I want to talk about is that like, well, I can. It's easier for me to empathize. Um, with people I agree with, or that to be empathetic with people means that I have to agree with them. And I, and I want to call out a couple of things. So the first is that, yes, we have to recognize that we all have the bias, the familiarity bias, that it is easier for us to connect with and empathize with people who look like us, who people who, who value things like the, who, who share similar values, right? And that it is, it can be more difficult. Um, you know, to empathize with people in different situations or who share beliefs that we disagree with. But again, I just want to reiterate and being like showing up empathetically doesn't mean you have to agree with somebody. It's just showing them and taking the time to understand what's meaningful to you, what's important to you. That doesn't mean I have to adopt it. It doesn't mean we have to argue about it. I'm simply just acknowledging what's important to you and like and understanding that. So I, just to break those down a little bit, and it's funny because, you know, we were working with a team a couple months ago, and it and it was like people were treating empathy like this sort of dirty four-letter word, um, you know. I won't say, you know, but just like it was like this dirty word, like oh, I don't know. And um, so my goal is by the end of this, I want to challenge challenge our beliefs on on empathy. So where I want to go next is I want to talk about the brain on stress because again. Right now, um, most people's brains um, are in a heightened state. They're in a heightened state because our routines have been disrupted. We are not getting the privilege of autopilot, right? Like our brains aren't getting a break because we are having to figure out new habits, new routines, new ways of communicating, new ways of working. Um, and uh, and um, 
And so there's that component, brain on stress. Um, there's also, you know, just the, you know, just the virus itself. I mean, there's a lot of people who either are at risk or have loved ones who are at risk or just want to make sure everyone in their life, you know, stays well and stays healthy. Well, there are people who are losing their jobs. Like there's a lot of stress right now. And um, so I want to take a moment and explain and break down like what is happening to our brains right now and, and then connect that to empathy and how empathy actually can downregulate, can help us um, slow down some of that stress response. So the picture you see up here is the amygdala. And anyone who knows me knows that I, I love the amygdala. I think it's my favorite part of the brain because it explains so much about human behavior. And you, can, you can't see it. When I jump on the camera at the end, I'm actually wearing my I love my amygdala shirt, just in honor of today. But so let me take a moment for those of you who are like, Mig amygdala, what, are, what is she talking about? All right, so here's your like super quick neuroscience 101. The amygdala is the part of our brain that um, lives sort of in the base, kind of like two almond shape, you know, organs that are in there. And one of its functions is to constantly scan the environment for threats. So one of the like one of the things its main functions is to constantly be evaluating: Am I a threat or aren't I? And what we have to realize is that our brain's number one job is to keep us alive, right? And so the amygdala helps by noticing any kind of threat. Now. Um, I, I like to think of the amygdala like a neurotic chihuahua and people who have seen me talk about this, usually I have a slide with my own neurotic chihuahua, but you know, it's like your amygdala is like this little shaky eight pound, you know, neurotic chihuahua that at any moment is just like, what was that? What was that? So here's, here's why it's important for us to understand the amygdala connecting to the situation and now connecting it to leadership. Our amygdala can move into a stress-based response in 0.07 seconds. In 0.07 seconds, I can go from being neutral to being keyed up and triggered. This is why I've had a lot of people recently ask me like, um, uh, like, why are people so defensive right now? Or people just seem really keyed up and, 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 or I feel like, you know, like there's a higher level of emotions and somebody, you know, just shared in, in the questions or sh shared a comment that like, um, they work in public health. And so there's this entire uh, sense of accountability for the community. So you can imagine how that would elevate your stress levels. Now, here's what happens when the amygdala gets triggered. And, and you have to understand that the amygdala can move to a stress-based response when it feels a threat, whether it's real or imagined. And that is really important that our brains kind of don't know the difference between an imagined threat and a real threat. And, and when I say threats, I don't just mean threats to us physically, but I also mean threats to us emotionally, threats to us psychologically, potentially threats to our ego, right? One of the best ways I think to, to describe the amygdala response is, imagine you're going about your day, you're sitting at your desk, you're in the zone, right? You're getting work done. And all of a sudden your boss sends you a message that says, stop on my office when you've got a chance, we need to talk. I don't know about you, but I immediately go into, oh, what did I do? What did I do wrong? What do I need to be prepared for, right? My heart starts racing, my neck might get a little warm, my hands might shake a little bit, right? That's that's our amygdala. And, um, oh yeah, somebody just shared that their amygdala freaked out on a global finance call recently, right? Like, And so this happens. So here's what happens when our amygdala hijacks. So 0 0.07 seconds moves from neutral state to a heightened state, and it does a couple of key things. It kicks off cortisol, it kicks off adrenaline, and it kicks off noradrenaline. Why am I telling you these things? Because when that happens, it puts our brain into a heightened survival state. The reason this is important for us as leaders to know this is that when amygdala, when amygdala, the amygdala triggers, we physically lose access to the higher functioning parts of our brain. We lose access to our prefrontal cortex. And guess what lives there? Problem solving, logic, reasoning, 
attention to detail, being able to focus. We know now that when our amygdala is in a heightened state, we also lose access to things like empathy and listening. And so this right now is a really important, uh, it's an important place for us to understand and notice when, when is our amygdala triggered and when are other people's amygdalas triggered as well, right? Because when we're in a stress-based response, we can't think logically, we can't be as productive as possible. This is why as leaders, especially when we're leading change, our number one job is to regulate the energy within us so that we can help regulate the energy and the stress levels within other people, right? That is how we help them navigate. So I want to um, pause a second. And I just, you know, I'm curious to hear from you. Um, just chat, uh, put in the, the question box, chat box, if you have them. If you don't, just reflect on yourself. But what, like, what happens when your amygdala triggers? What does it feel like? I know for me, my my heart starts racing. So I'm curious to just hear from a few of you. What happens when your amygdala gets hijacked? When your amygdala hijacks your brain rather. So somebody wrote that um, I'm an emotional person. So I get panicked. My mind goes to the worst place. My arms go numb. My face gets hot and I feel like my blood pressure instantly rises. My palms are sweaty. Somebody else talked about losing focus, racing a heart, potentially tears, heavy breathing. Um, so we feel this physiologically because again, our brain is kicking out these hormones. I don't think before I speak, I get defensive. Maybe I get scattered brained. Um, you know, somebody was asking about how do we handle the different levels of amygdala triggers? I'll talk about that in a moment. So as these are coming in, some people get short tempered, beautiful, beautiful awareness on that. Um, I fall into the rabbit hole of, uh, worst case scenarios. I see others as the enemy. I, I want to pause on this one again, because when we are in a stress-based response, our brain is in survival mode, which means its number one job is to protect us. And we are more likely to be cautious. We're more likely to be skeptical. We're more likely to view others as a threat. Um, somebody asked, where do I find the chat box? I don't know. It doesn't exist. Apparently, you know, when we talk about the amygdala, I'll be transparent. My amygdala was triggering, triggering earlier when we couldn't figure out like the chat function, right? My, my heart was racing. My head was like, oh crap, are we going to be able to figure this out? And then my thoughts went to, well, what are they going to think about me? And what is this, you know, like what's going to happen, right? Like, and I'm sure Rachel's amygdala was figuring out, you know, like firing off too as well. Okay. So I want you all to become pros at the amygdala. The other thing that I want to just take a moment to pause on, I could talk forever about the amygdala because I think it's so important for people to understand it because it just gives yourself and other people, it makes it easier to give grace of like, oh, their amygdala is firing right now. But like good, good, just good tip. Now that you're aware of the amygdala, it's like the matrix, you'll start seeing it everywhere, but don't tell people, wow, your amygdala is really triggering. It's not going to end well, just I promise you. Um, one of the things that's happening right now collectively as a society, and I'm going to share this article when we send you the recording afterwards, is there, there's this collective grieving that's happening right now. There's this collective sense of loss and, um, and this loss of routine, this loss of um, potentially self-care, this loss of time. Um, there's also this anticipatory grieving. There's this beautiful article written recently. And so again, we'll share the resource in the email when we send out the recordings. But there's a lot of anticip anticipatory anxiety and grief right now of like, what happens if I get sick? What happens if my parents get sick? So one of the things that I wanted to share with you is to realize that your, your team members, as well as you, like these, this, the brain is on in a way that it hasn't been before. And I like to think of it like an app that's just running in the background, right? That that these thoughts we're having, these 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 worries, whether they're conscious or unconscious, these um, losses we're experiencing, these adaptations we're having to make, it's like an app that's running in our brain all the time now. Now, sometimes, like for me, there are some moments during the day where it's just kind of slowly draining the battery down, and then there are other times like. Uh, full transparency, last night it crashed the system. I just had a moment of like, my heart feels really heavy. I can't focus. I'm just struggling right now, right? And so we have to recognize that our team members are all are having this app kind of constantly running right now in a way that it just maybe hasn't run before in such a collective way. So, so let's talk about what are some barriers 
to um, being an empathetic leader. So there's there's sort of two key barriers. Um, uh, is that we are, um, oh, I just wanna take a moment. Uh, Bobby Malloy, thank you for this. In order to find the questions chat, people ne need to hit the orange arrow to show the control panel. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Thanks for having my, my, my back on that. All right, so here are the two uh, barriers that get in the way of being an empathetic leader. The first is this need to um, know and this need to fix. And, and when we are in a place of, of, of needing to be right, um, needing to have it done our way, needing it to be about people coming to our space and doing it our way, we just simply can't be empathetic, right? So these are barriers. They then connected to that is um, fixing. So, uh, a lot of us have been promoted and rewarded because of our ability to solve problems. We have been rewarded as leaders because we've been able to bring knowledge to the table that was valuable. We've been able to take care of problems. But the, but when we're talking about humans and, and emotions, like it's that's not our job to fix. Right? And so if we're focused on fixing, then we're actually potentially creating a barrier of just connecting with them and giving them the space to be able to work through their issues on their own way. All right, so um, let's go on to what are the steps for how we can lead with empathy. So the first, the first thing we can do is to listen deeply. And and then I want you to listen deeper still, right? When we, we need to recognize that we spend most of our time listening from a place of what does this mean to us, right? Like right now on this webinar, the over 300 of you who are with us right now, which I just have to tell you, this just like makes my heart just fill with so much joy to have so many people wanna learn about this. But right now you're focused on, well, what does this mean for me? How can I apply it? Do I agree with it? Is this going to be helpful? I have this employee. All of you, for the most part, are thinking, what does this mean to me? An empathetic step is to shift from the focus being on us and the focus being on others. What does this mean to them? I promise you, probably only like a few of you have had moments of, oh, I wonder how Sarah's feeling right now right? I'm sure, I know my sister's on, so I'm sure she's like, oh, I hope she, she's feeling okay about this. But, um, uh, oh, I love that. So somebody shared that uh, Krista Tippett describes it as listen generously. Oh, I love that. Like, just give it away. So when we talk about listening deeply, it's about not just listening, catching our tendency to listen from a place of making it about us and focusing on others. What does this mean to them? What is important to them? What, you know, what do they value? What, what is going on for them? And again, we don't have to agree with it. We just need to understand it so we can honor it. So I wanna talk about two specific things that I want you to listen for, especially right now. This disruption of our lives, of our work, is causing a lot of loss. And in fact, when, when we do work with teams on navigating change and working with leaders of how to navigate change, the first place we have to, we, what we have to realize is that it's not that people fear change, they fear loss, right? And right now we are all experiencing loss, right? Um, whether that's loss of time uh, with your colleagues, maybe it's loss of sales, maybe it's loss of structure, maybe it's loss of, of, of focus because you have your kids with you, um, loss of being able to work out, wh whatever it is. So when you're talking to your team members, when you're in conversation right now, I want you to go below the surface of what they're saying and I want you to listen for the loss, right? Um, and here's what I wanna do. I want you to experiment with me for a moment. I, I want to take them, we're going to, I want to play this out because I, I always like to figure out like, how do we make webinars more interesting? So it isn't just me awkwardly talking to myself in my living room. So I want to tell you about my day yesterday. I'm going to be really vulnerable and transparent. And I want you to listen for two things. What did you hear is important to me? And like, what are potential losses that I might be experiencing? And then when you hear those, I just want you to, um, uh, that that I just want you to put it in the chat. And so um, I, uh, 
uh, so here was my day yesterday. So I woke up and I was feeling pretty good. I was really energized. Um, and I was super excited about the work that we're doing as a team, you know, the, like the, 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 the things that we're getting to innovate now because of the constraints and, and just like, I had a bounce in my stuff in a way that I just hadn't had in a while. And then, and then about like seven o'clock last night, I felt like my energy just took this spill. And I went from like being good to being neutral to just feeling heavy. Um, you know, I, I was hearing from more people I knew in my life who were being diagnosed. I was hearing from friends in my life um, whose parents are elderly and at high risk who were recently diagnosed. Um, I, I, I read this, this tweet that was like, just broke my heart of, you know, just realized that potentially if somebody you love goes to the hospital, you might not be able to, to talk with them. And I found myself just like, my heart was so heavy. And um, so I'll just pause there. So what, what did you hear? So you heard things like fear of unknown, friends and family are important to me, that I was scared, that I was afraid, loss of safety, loss of security, um, that your friends and family are important to you. Yeah, this loss of relationship, this loss of sense of security, helplessness, loss of connection. Ugh. This is, uh, you can't see the screen, but I wish you could because I've just got like tears in my eyes. The loss of energy, the proximity of the loss closing in, um, feeling helpless, overwhelmed, maybe some guilt. Oh yes, Kim, maybe some guilt about being excited about the opportunities in light of the loss. You're so spot on. Um, it became real to you personally mm. in a very real way it did. Um, so imagine all these beautiful things you heard because you were listening differently to me. Imagine if, if you and I are in a conversation and after I told that story, when you said, hey, Sarah, how's it going? I was like, man, last night was tough. Imagine if you said, um, man, I can hear how real this became to you personally. Imagine if you were to said, like, I can hear that there's like a tension that maybe you feel guilty. Uh, about like being excited about things, but then there's like this rest of this stuff. Or imagine if in the conversation you said things like, oh, I can just see how important your friends and family are. Or I don't know if this is true. I can sense how like there's a sense like energy of helplessness. This is what empathetic listening looks like, to listen deeper because what's beautiful is you hear it. You are all so capable of listening in a way beyond what you like maybe get to practice. And what I'm asking you to do is to be intentional about it and then bring that into your conversations. So when you hear those losses, when you hear what's important to people, I want you to say it. Because when you say it, what you are telling that other person is I hear you and I see you. And I wanna connect this back to the amygdala now. When we feel heard, it starts to create an opposite reaction and it starts to calm down that amygdala. It's like throwing that little neurotic chihuahua on his back and giving him a little belly scratch. Also, when people feel heard, the same part of their, their, their brain lights up as trust. The other tip that I have for listening deeply is that almost always there's a question behind the question. So when people are asking you questions about things like, so what are we going to, you know, so what, you know, like what are, I'm trying to think of a good example. What are we going to do about, you know, like the fact that all of our, all of our events got pushed off until, till the fall. Like there's a question behind the question. The question really isn't about the events. The question is likely, will I have a job? Will there be security? Do I feel confident we're going to weather this? Whatever the case is. So always be listening for what's the question behind the question. And sometimes I will even ask that, like if, Somebody asks me a question, I'll, and if I sense that there's something behind it that they're just not, they like not willing, or afraid, or don't even realize was sort of the initial thought, I'll ask them like, so what's actually your question, and what's the question behind the question, or what what question do you want to ask me, and you you aren't sure if you should, and now let's have that conversation. We do a lot of work around. Um, uh, 
Yeah, like we do a lot of work in um, around like, how do we get rid of the elephant in the room? How do we free the elephant in the room? And one of the ways we can do it is try to understand like what's really going on behind what like what people are bringing up and what are they curious about? So that's our first step is to listen deeply. And so I want to, um, just for purposes of time, I wanna move to, um, here's an action you can take today. And that is, I want you in this moment to think of one person, one person who you will, you will talk to today. And this could be a coworker, this could be a family member, this could be you know, a, a friend. And I want you to listen from the place of what does this mean to them? I want you to listen from a place of what are they saying? How are they saying it? And also, what are they not saying, right? Because when we listen to that place, we can tap into so much more information and data, right? Because, you know, one of the things that's been an interesting side effect of this whole situation is like, we don't have those surface to surface conversations anymore. I don't, I'm not walking past somebody on the way to the bathroom saying, hey, how's your day going? And then not really listen or slow down to hear it. I mean, it's like when we're connecting with people, it's like this craving of just like conversation and connecting. So now is this beautiful time to say, to listen to people and then to like reflect back to them. Here's what I hear is important to you. I'm curious, like what's behind what you're saying. And here's like, I'm sensing this is a struggle for you. These are really simple, but powerful things that will completely transform how people respond to you. Um, so that's our first tip. Um, and then I just want to share this beautiful quote, and I don't know if there will be time for it to come up on the slide, but I'll, I'll say it out loud so you can hear it because I want to be conscious. A loving silence often has far more power to heal and connect than most well-intended words. So I just, I love that so much. All right. So the next thing we can do is that we can use emotionally supportive language versus emotionally dismissive, right? Um, so we'll give it a moment and it'll come up. But what I wanna do is I wanna talk a little bit about this, is that um, emotionally supportive, let me move to my next slide. All right, so there are times when we might unintentionally be emotionally dismissive and not even realize. If there's anyone in the audience who, who would lovingly describe themselves as a suck it up buttercup type of leader, um, you know, congratulations, that's pretty emotionally dismissive. <laughs> and But I will say, there is a time and place sometimes for suck it up buttercup, but that's for another webinar. But I wanna talk about what is emotionally dismissive um, language look like versus emotionally supportive. So the first is emotionally dismissive is like minimizing feelings, right? So that if somebody is sharing with you, like, I'm really struggling, like, I'm really, you know, um, just worried about, are my parents going to be safe? And the response is like, well, yeah, you know, it's everyone's struggling with that right now, right? Or maybe you negate the feeling. And this is something I've been hearing from a lot of people who are maybe in, in a better financial situation, right? And that people will say, they're like, oh, I'm just really struggling and I'm worried about like the future. And, and somebody might say, well, I mean, you, like you have a good life. You're all set. You have enough, right? Like financially, you're good, right? You see how that's minimizing and dismissing their emotions, even if the intentions are good, like your intentions might be beautiful. Your intentions might be, I wanna like help you see a possibility you're not seeing. Um, the other is that you want a quick resolution, right? This is where the suck it up buttercup comes in. Um, for those of you in the audience who are my beautiful, like hyper optimistic people, um, sometimes our desire for optimism can actually be dismissive, right? So if I'm really struggling and you're like, but Sarah, look at the bright side, you get to do this and this and this, what you've done is you've sort of shoved my emotions aside and like, and, and, um, and, and what happens is that the consequence is it makes me feel like I'm, um, uh, like I feel shameful now, like, well, I guess I shouldn't have been worried about it. Um, you know, somebody just shared, I'm guilty of, you want me to do something about it? Or what's the point of telling me or talking about it? And this, um, uh, Charvis talks about how I've done a lot of work on just listening, doing nothing is really tough, right? Because we want to, we want to go into action, we want to plan. But again, like just saying, like, I can see and I can hear how hard this is to you. Um, so let's talk about what it looks like to be emotionally supportive, that you validate all feelings. I can see why you're angry. 
um, I can hear how frustrating this is for you. You know, there's a big movement that people, you know, of like chasing happiness. Um, I'm a firm believer in just chasing our humanity. Um, all emotions are good. All emotions are, well, let me clarify this. All emotions are fine. It's what we do with those emotions that can become the problems, right? Like all emotions are normal, natural, and part of just the human experience. Um, but it's what do we, like the actions from them is what can make them become detrimental. So just like validating all feelings, you know, you have, uh, Teresa tomorrow is going to be talking um, when she talks about the tips of how do we support our kids during this time and, and, and how do we navigate working from home with them. And, and one of the things she'll just explore is like your kids are going through a lot of loss too. So how do we validate those feelings? Some of you have seniors in high school who aren't going to, who aren't going to maybe have a graduation ceremony or prom that sucks. And we don't need to help them like think about things from a positive light. Like we just need to be with them and hold space for them and say like, this is hard. And, you know, um, seek to understand. I think the three most important words we could use in any conversation. And this is for those of you who like to fi uh, fix things is that, um, um, is to, to just say, tell me more. A question came up. What if the person doesn't know what they need in the moment? Um, just be there. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes that feels awkward because we're so used to filling space and we're so used to solving things that simply just saying like, I know this is a hard time and, um, I'm, you know, like, tell me more about what you're feeling or, um, or if there are things you think of, like of how to support, just do it instead of asking. And then just like, yeah, I mean, just guiding emotional regulation. What do you need in this moment? And again, some people don't. Sometimes people just need to talk about something. They don't need it to be fixed. They just need it. You know, last night I'm sitting on my chair. My husband's on the couch. And I said, I just think I need to cry right now. I don't need you to do anything. I just need to cry, right? So this is what it looks like to be emotionally supportive versus emotionally dismissive. Um, my dear friend, Paul. Um, oh, so here's the tip you can do. Here's the action is I want you to, if you have team members right now, um, I would encourage you to just like call um, and ask them like, how are you doing really? Uh, what is on your mind that would be important for me to know? I think this is something I've been talking about a lot with my, my coaching clients is there's a lot on people's brains that um, uh, they might not even realize, right? Or aren't sure how to share. And so just again, getting that information is valuable. So I realized that um, uh, because of some of the technical issues, we're coming up on time. So I'm just going to be real. I'm just going to keep going. I understand if some of you will have to drop off at two. So please know we're going to record this entire thing. So if you miss the last half, um, you'll be able to go back and watch it. But we're just going to keep this going because there's some really, I'm, I'm eager to get to some of these other things. And like t typical Sarah fashion, I, I try to put more in than I can. So I'm just embracing that. All right. So call your team members, ask them, how are you doing really? Don't ask about work. Don't ask about whatever, ask about them personally. Every time I've connected with one of my clients or even one of my friends, there's just this like release in their shoulders because they feel like they can just be human and messy and present. And guess what? Like those emotions also are temporary. And so once those go away, then we're able to, you know, have a productive conversation. Um, my good friend, Paul Ruiz, is an amazing coach and facilitator down in the Philippines. And he and I were having a call a couple of weeks ago. And I wrote down this quote of his that I want to share with you that I think is so beautiful. And that is, um, you know, when we're dealing with these strong emotions for ourselves or even for other people, that there's this tendency that we want to control them, that we want to push them aside. And, you know, and, and his quote is, if you're trying to fight the emotion, it's just going to stay but when you dance with it, it will eventually get tired of you. And I think there's something really beautiful from the, um, uh, yeah, from the um, perspective of just like, how do we, how do we, um, how do we just dance with it? One of the metaphors that I want to share with you, because I think this, so this is just my personal gift to you, because I think we all are having um, a roller coaster of emotions and trying to figure it out, is I want you to imagine this metaphor when you have a strong emotion that comes up that you're trying to push away. I want you to imagine you're in a pool of water and you have a rubber ball and that rubber ball is, uh, you want to just imagine the rubber ball is that emotion you don't want and you just push it under the water 
And the more you push it under the water, what happens? It just bounces back up. And the more and the harder you push it down, what happens? It just bounces up with equal force back. But so I invite you and for yourself and also invite you to help manage your team members of like, so what does it look like for us to just let this emotion be here? And eventually that ball doesn't bob anymore. It slowly gets more still. Maybe it touches us, but eventually it starts to move away and it floats away, right? And it's temporary. So I think that that's just, that's been a really um, powerful metaphor for me when I think about those emotions that I want to try to control. Um, so I want to take a moment and look at some of the questions that are coming up. Um, okay. So, um, so now I want to talk about um, step three is be flexible. And again, you know, in the earlier, we were talking about how this is not business as usual because our brains are just overwhelmed and overstimulated in a way that most of us haven't experienced over this long of a haul. Um, there is right now, um, especially for people who have families and children at home, especially young children, um, there's little time to recharge and for self-care. And so, so we need to think about how can we be more flexible, right? Every call I've had with somebody who's had kids, there's at least a, a, a you know a few second interruption where their kid is coming on to the screen and she is uh, uh, you know and she's making a silly face or whatever the case is. Like things are just a little messy right now. So you, so remember that your team members might have kids. And I just want to pause here. I've been hearing from so many people where they they're like people understand it but i think they they don't really understand it that when both parents are working i have clients who are literally like i'm going to work for 2 hours while he watches the kids and he's going to work for 2 hours while i watch the kids and that is just extending that out and you can imagine how exhausting that is you also have team members right now who have mental health challenges they might be struggling with anxiety um, um they might have depression um a couple of people were uh talking about um, just how sometimes it's like your, your the presence of your own kids can cause stress, right? Other people's kids don't bother you. You're like, oh, that's cute. That's fine. He's in the shop. But when yours does, every person whose kids have interrupted a call, this is what happens. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for this. I'm so sorry. Um, you have people on your team who um, have some neurodiversity challenges. You know, I've been talking with some good friends who struggle with ADHD like I do, and they're like, it's just so overstimulating right now with all the like video conferencing and having my kids at home and all of this. Um, you have people in your life um, or your team members who are either they are at high risk and you don't realize it, or they love somebody who is and that is on their brain. You also might have people that you don't um, are on your team who might be in an abusive situation and now they're stuck at home with them. So flexibility is really critical right now. And this is why when we say this isn't business as usual, it's because it isn't. Now that's not to say we shouldn't try to um, hold on to our power, create some normalcy, create some routines in this but it's probably not gonna look like it did before. So I wanna talk a little bit about what are some of the things that we can do. So some of the things we can do is if like when possible, adjust production goals and objectives, right? Like what is realistic for us to really get done given the circumstances? Um, if possible, adjust total hours worked. You know, a really fun fact is that we and under normal circumstances peak in productivity like what research shows fairly consistently and conclusively is like we're productive about three to four hours out of the day. That's about it, right? Which I'm a big advocate for the four, four day work week. But like to think about are there ways you can reduce hours without necessarily reducing pay um, or if you have to, um, but like how can we adjust the hours work? The other thing I've heard from a few people and it's sort of broken my heart. They're like, I am in virtual meetings 90% of the day and I have a two year old and I have a four year old and my husband's also in meetings. And so something to be thoughtful about is, is how can we navigate so we aren't stacking meetings on top of each other? I don't know about you, but from the standpoint of um, virtual calls, is not the same as being in person. Um, there's like a different level of energy. You, you project a little bit differently. You're aware of different things. And so it does um, deplete you in a different way than if we were just having in-person calls. And so just be thoughtful about what kind of meetings you're having or expecting people to have. And then the last one is if you are in a business where you can um, give some flexibility to how and when they work, do that. 
um, if it's something that doesn't have to happen between eight and five, you know, one of my clients was talking about because she and her husband tag team on the kids. She said, sometimes I'm working until, you know, later at night, because that's when I can actually like get really productive. So these are just a couple of things we can do to, to again, come from a place of empathy and give people some grace during this time. And then what I'll hear is like, but Sarah, what if people take advantage of all of this, right? What, but there, some people are gonna take advantage of this flexibility. Okay, I'm gonna have like a real talk here. I, when I worked in uh, leadership at a previous position, previous company, a couple companies back, this was something we constantly were building policies for the 2% that were gonna take advantage of it. Guess what? The 92% were then punished for that. I do not subscribe to and would invite you to not create policies from a place of, uh, but people might take advantage of this. Um, your job as a leader is to hold people accountable. And if you have people who are abusing it, then you need to hold them accountable appropriately to that. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't not offer something because you are afraid that somebody might do something, right? So I just wanna, that's my little soapbox. I'm stepping off of it. Okay. We have about 10 more minutes. So again, I understand if you have to step off, we'll record it. Um, you can have it. Um, all right. <laughs> preach, Sarah, preach. Yep. Very, very passionate about that. So here's, here's the action you can take. I want you to identify one change you could make this week that could have a positive impact on your team members' workload. And I want you to change it. And, and not only do I want you to change it, but I want you to explain why you are changing it, right? So even if it's something simple, even if it's simple as, hey, I know that like it's been really overwhelming with the kids. And so if there are things that like you need to, you know, potentially work on um, over the weekend, like please do. Now, again, we want to protect personal time. But again, these are these are different situations. So we need to get creative. Or if you are, you know, like or you let everyone go early on Friday. Say, hey, you know, tomorrow I want you to like I want you to log off at three. This has been a hard week. And I want you to be with your family and just have the chance to, to breathe. There are little things we can do that don't cost money or don't cost a lot of money that could have significant impacts over acknowledging what people are experiencing them and giving them the opportunity to be able to show up more powerfully. Um, all right, so my last step is I want you to make your, um, I want you to make your empathy visible and verbal. And what I mean by this is I have a ton of leaders who are amazing and their intentions are wonderful and they feel things, they worry about their team members, they care about their team members. And when I ask them questions like, do they know? Like, well, I've never said anything, should I? Yes, I think, you know, um, especially now, right? Again, people are looking for that calm in the chaos and that the more verbal and visible we can be with the things we're doing to support our team members, the better. So I want to share with you what this looks like. If you decide to give your team members some flexibility, like let's say you take the idea of, hey, I'm going to let everyone go early tomorrow because this has been a hard week. I want you to say like why you're letting them go, um, you know, from a place of care, from a place of wanting to like take, you know, care of of them from recognizing the challenges they have and, and connect those dots for people because people might not always connect those dots. Um, you know, if, if it's a situation where there are things you are doing to make sure that the company is more stable right now, there's like, that's good to share with people. Um, you know, I was working with a leader recently and, you know, we talked about how when people feel included, that can help down regulate their, their amygdala and like, don't just invite people onto meetings, um, let them know why you're inviting them. Hey, Sally, um, you're really good at X and I really want you to be a part of this conversation because I know you'll add a lot of value. So just think about ways that you can be visible and verbal, even if it's as simple as telling somebody, I know this has been a hard week and I really appreciate you, right? Don't assume that people know how much you care for them Make sure that you say it, because especially as like team members in the world right now, our brain, are, they're so triggered that we just need to hear that to be able to pull out. So what are some things we can do? I want you to think about like ways we can make it verbal and visible is I want you to acknowledge them, um, be specific, right? Like make sure you're acknowledging people for the work they're doing, the, the, the challenges they're uh, tackling, sacrifices maybe they're making and be really specific, right? So it isn't just, hey, I appreciate you, but it's, 
hey, um, you know, Teresa, I really appreciate it. Actually, Teresa's on the line, so I'll give her some acknowledgement, my team member. I really appreciated the fact that last night you uh, took my text at nine o'clock when I was struggling and offered to um, help look at this presentation. Um, it had a really significant impact on my ability to finish it as well as sleep, sleep okay, right? So be specific, um, include people and explain why, and then most importantly, celebrate them, right? Like uh, celebrate them, show them, uh, you know, show them their impact, help support them. Again, these little moments can go a long way and, and, and all of these, so like when people feel acknowledged, guess what? Down regulates the amygdala. When they feel included, guess what? Down regulates the amygdala. When they feel celebrated, down, rates the, down regulates the amygdala. So these are three specific practices um, that we can do in how we show up in our conversation that can actually start to decrease the level of stress people are having so that we can focus on what's most important and what we need to do. So if you have questions, um, I know that I won't have time to answer answer them, but you can put them in the box. And what we will do is just figure out a way to answer them and to explore them, whether that's a short video follow-up, putting together maybe a simple article to share when we share the recording. But please, if there's any questions, you can also reach out to me on social media and I can answer those. I just wanted like, I want to take a moment and just like to think about the fact that um, I firmly believe that if you cannot, like if you don't care about the people you serve, I would challenge why you're leading people. Um, you know, because these are people with whom you are going to spend way more time with than other people. And, and we have to understand that a great leader can not only excel at processes and products, you also have to excel with the people side of it. Um, we're also going to send you a resource on um, some strategies for how you can be um, build empathy for people who you have a difficult relationship with. So you can look forward to that. That's some bonus material we'll send to you in the follow-up email. And as we are wrapping up our time, um, oh, I just, I just want to, I want to pause on this one quote. This is a, a good friend of mine. She always says this, what comes from the heart touches the heart. So when we communicate from a place of care, when we communicate from a place of compassion, people feel that, they know that, right? And then they'll feel heard, they'll feel valued, and they'll feel seen, and then they'll, right? That'll increase trust. It'll increase their focus, their engagement, and you will be able to continue to move forward together. So as we wrap up, you know, I shared the slide with empathy myths, and I just want to end on um, strengths, right? Um, empathy allows us to connect in deeper ways. Empathy gives us insight and empathy allows us to build trust. And for those of you who productivity is like the most important value for you, all of these will help increase that. For those of you who value these, then that will happen too. So, um, you know, I started by saying that like some people think of empathy as a four letter word like kind of a dirty four letter word. I actually think maybe maybe it's a different four letter word and the one that the world needs right now. So that wraps up our time together. Thank you for being patient and hanging out a little bit more as we navigated some of those technical difficulties. Here are a few ways we can stay connected. Um, please connect with us on social media. Um, you know, that's where I share insights, personal learnings, and maybe an occasional picture of my dogs. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter um, I'll go ahead and bring my camera on so I can like properly say goodbye to everyone. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter by going to our website. And that's again, where we share really, we try to be really thoughtful about the information we share. We do have a webinar, another free webinar tomorrow that'll be facilitated by Teresa on my team. And she, um, She's gonna be bringing her education background and giving beautiful strategies for how you can help support your kids. And I, and I wanna just tell you something. One of the leaders that signed up for the webinar tomorrow, the reason she said she signed up, and I don't, I mean, if this isn't a beautiful uh, empathetic leader, I don't know what is. She said, I don't have kids myself, but my team members do, and I'm signing up so I can learn more about how I can support them. Boom, who would you wanna work for? All right, so we have a webinar tomorrow. We will send out the recordings in the next couple of days along with additional resources that we talked about. Um, and then the other thing I'll ask is just, you know, what other information would be valuable during this time? What are things that we can bring to the table that we can explore with you? And we'll ask just a simple question. So here's just my final thought as we jump off the line. 
Today, we talked about how to show up more powerfully for other people. Um, but I want to make sure that we understand that the first place we need to start is to show up more powerfully for ourselves, right? And you can start by doing that by giving yourself some grace, some grace that you might not be as productive, some grace that you might not get as much sleep, some grace that you might not get as much downtime, right? When we, when we are able to give others that which we're able to give ourselves. So my wish for you all who are still on the line is that I, I, my wish for you is grace to rest, grace to connect, grace to cry, and grace to laugh. We might survive this, you know, we can survive this alone, but I know we will thrive together. So thank you all so much, so sincerely, so much love to you. Go forth and be amazing for your leaders, and we will look forward to connecting, you, connecting with you afterwards. So have a really beautiful and brilliant day.